Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to the Rise of Retirement Podcast. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. So this is a great time to talk about the five principles of successful investing, Brad, because um, did you did you see that CNN town hall with, uh, with Trump? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make you go back to your principles of investing very, very quickly very, very quickly, which you we'll cover. And, and this um, is perfect timing for it with the perfect information in the perfect place. <laughs> I, I got to tell you. I mean, I know, I know you didn't watch that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't watch it either. Honestly, I could care less about it. Um, but it just kind of blew up the internet. So I had to go back and watch it, which you can't find because CNN's like pretty much erased it from, <laughs> from, from everywhere. Um, but, but there is, uh, there were a couple of people who, who had recorded it. And so I watched it on their YouTube channel and, um, my gosh, I mean, talking about PTSD from the prior election. And so I started looking at, you know, I like stats, right? So I started looking at stats. So he's lead, Trump's leading the primary, Republican primary, which is, hasn't even really officially even started, started yet. yet. Yeah. Uh, DeSantis is like imploding and he, and he hasn't even like put his foot in the race yet officially. But he, it's, um, he has like a 40, 40% lead in the primary. And he's in what well, he's up in New Hampshire is where this thing took place. So if you go back in history, you look at um, Republican leaders at this point when they've led by this much, much of a margin, they've always become the nominee. They think, okay, well, we're going to have a repeat. So then you immediately go, okay, well, what are the Democrats going to serve up? Because you got this Robert Kennedy Jr. right that's that's running, um, which Democrats don't like. They call him a conspiracy theorist. I actually, listen to. Um, the all in podcast, how they add that to the show notes, uh, all in podcast, uh, uh, where they interview, um, Robert Kennedy jr. You guys should listen to that podcast. Very, very interesting. Uh, if anything, just from historical standpoint, um, I love history too, but, uh, just from a historical standpoint, when he talks about, um, president Kennedy and then ultimately his dad, who was his also, dad made what Bobby Kennedy, you're right. Right. right who's also, um, uh, assassinated, I believe in Chicago, um, if I Is remember that the, correctly. Uh, Sirhan Sirhan? I believe so, yes. That was um, in uh, Los Angeles, I think. Oh, that's right, yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I assume anyone gets assassinated in Chicago, but... <laughs> I think it was St. Valentine's maybe, Day massacre. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. Maybe it was safer back then. I don't know. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, assuming that we're in some type of a weird recession, that maybe is the soft landing that everyone wants for, uh, is hoping for. Uh, a sitting president doesn't ever uh, survive a recession and get reelected historically. <laughs> So you have, you know who the Republican nominee is going to be, it seems at this point, because how could it get worse? In the, how can it get the new cycle get worse for Trump? I, I, it's like nothing sticks to the guy, right? Yeah. And then you've got Biden uh, on the other side who who apparently um, is a, obviously is a sitting president who is presiding over some um, very difficult uh, economic times. Uh, and you you kind of marry the two stats together and you're like, oh, goodness. Uh, and then I get angry because I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there reading all this and I'm going, why, why do we keep, why, why do we have to have two 80 plus year old men? One who's a little crazy is crazy. And the other one who doesn't know where he is <laughs> running, running for president. This is like, this is the best America has to offer. I just don't understand it. it it's so frustrating. And, and obviously I'm going to be a little selfish, but obviously um, it changes all of our interactions because people are so polarized by this that we have half our client base who just, well, I'll probably say half, maybe 25% of our client base who absolutely hates Trump. I think this is the worst thing ever, right? And then you have you know 75% who are like, well, we can't keep going down this direction with this current administration for all these reasons. But 
None of that matters to your and that portfolio. Being the point of us bringing this up. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just that so frustrating the, that you think you're always things that are occurring. Yes. Okay, that are out of our control as investors. So we're going to focus on the things that are in our control as Correct. investors. Correct. Right. It's like you're not going to wake up and run your life. You're not going to go hang, you know, be with your grandkids or your children. You're not going to do the things you enjoy because they're the in your view, the wrong political party is is out there. You know, screw those guys. Go. This is America, man. I mean, this, this is what I love about this is that they can go screw up the country, but as long as you can create things and be innovative in this country and 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 come here and and live your best life without interference from them, which for the most part, I mean, unless you're in some business that's polluting lakes and <laughs> and rivers, mm-hmm. yeah, you might get a little cross. If you don't pay your taxes, you might get a little cross with them. But other than that, um. This is the best place to in the country to live. I, so I, I, I and it, you know, I'm talking about small business owners, I guess, in, in that respect. But your portfolio is the same way. You're, you're, you know, every company's woke. If you, if you, if you're angry about woke companies, the entire S and P 500 checks all those boxes. The bottom line is, what you want that company to do is you want that company to make money. That's right. That's you what know, it comes down to. You want the free flow of capital to its highest earning potential. And nowhere else in the world do we have the free formation of capital that we have here in the United States. Nowhere. Right. There's places that right. make it look that way, but right. it's not actually happening that way. And so when we get asked questions, and we do from time to time, is the dollar going to remain the, the world's currency reserve? You have yes. to answer it in such a way that there is no <laughs> other place in the world where a capital formation is as free Yep. And openness as in the United States. I'm, okay. I'm working on that one, Brad. I, I've 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 got a couple of professors that are uh, friends of the podcast in mind, but I want to break that down because we when we talk about China and you know China is a facade. China's not you know China's not a real economy, right? It's not a free economy. I mean, there's people there who buy things, but it's all manufactured. Their 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 bond yields are set by the government. It's not free floating like here in the U.S. To my point, it's not a free formation of capital. Correct. And where it flows to the highest purpose. Correct. And yeah. what is their currency pegged to? Right. It's pegged to the U.S. dollar. That's why the U.S. government gets frustrated with with the trade because they artificially peg it just below <laughs> the U.S. dollar, so it benefits them. But that's what. That's what they're doing. Um, they're, that's why they buy so so much uh, U.S. bonds. I think they're currently selling a lot, but that's all about the float, right? Mm-hmm. All about the pegging. So it, uh, ultimately, if if the world were to move to trade in Chinese currency, it's still in the U.S. dollar, which that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, the Chinese put up barriers of uh, capital flowing out of their country. So companies that have invested over there are now for currently going there, trying to figure out a way to divest themselves <laughs> right. and move that money to other places where right. it's more free formation of yeah. capital. So it's 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 an it's an interesting dynamic that's occurring now. They are the second largest economy in the world, so it 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 tends to beg the question constantly. Will they ever be larger than the U.S. in an economic sense? Will they ever take over as the currency of reserve in the world? But it's it's they not going to happen in, in yours and my you know no. investing lifetime. They I would think. have to have a currency that's free floating by itself, right? If you were going to eliminate U.S. dollars, and that right now the, that currency is not free floating by itself, and if it did free float by itself, and this is this is where I, I want to get experts on this podcast about this because it gets very complicated. But it, it wouldn't float; it would sink, which is which is why or become super volatile, and their inflation would go through the roof. Um, so this is why, in the end, um, they own so much U.S. U.S. Treasuries, is because that's what their currency is is tied to. Now you could argue that um, there's a currency that is a modern day currency that's pegged to precious metals like such as gold. But I think that would be short lived. I, I don't know that that I don't know that you can do that long term. It, just, it doesn't quite make sense to me how you could you could well, do it in the, the short small all vacuum. commodities are limited in nature. 
Right. At some point in time, they will be exhausted. Right. It may be a long time from now, but they are limited in nature. There's Correct. only X amount of them. You have to find them. <laughs> yeah. You have to mine them. You have to refine them. And then you have to make them valuable. Okay. And, and, and this is where the subject gets very complicated. And I don't want to go much further than, than this. Yeah. But when the problem is that people take bits and pieces of of all that and then they send me emails and letters stating um hey look at, read this or watch this and it can be very time consuming i can't watch every one hour and a half video that <laughs> someone sends me of someone i've never heard of on 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 the internet right but when i have watched it's um half truths and then in the end <laughs> What are they pushing for? They're trying to sell something. Subscribe. Send me forty nine ninety five a month yeah. for my newsletter on how to uh, survive in a current in a fallen America or whatever it is. They're selling fear and they're um, the call to action, as they say in marketing. The call to action is to subscribe to um, is subscribe to that 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 page and pay money. And, and it's just like you know, I've talked about this before. You know, I remember. Um, I read an article one time about value investing and how value is going to be the main way of or the best return over the next 10 years and afford it to you. Good. Hey, what are we missing here? And <laughs> your immediate response back to me was like, uh, Oh, this is written by a value mutual fund manager. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. This is a value mutual fund manager. So of course he's going to say that or else he wouldn't have a fund. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so mm-hmm. it, it's, it's the, the whole point here is, politics are going to get nasty uh they're already nasty but i don't think it's like mainstream nasty now it's going to get really nasty for a a second round match biden trump and i don't care how you vote and and it's going to be very polarizing people are going to be very passionate by either side as long as you can come to this country create a company you can sell your wares you can grow a business you can sell that business and make a fortune which is the american dream right or to work in enterprise that's stable, right? It doesn't matter. If they put capitalism on the ballot, then we have a problem. We almost did. You know, Bernie Sanders was never a, um, he didn't like capitalism. He wanted, he calls himself a socialist, right? He we almost in Russia. Right, right. <laughs> we almost, we almost had that election. We almost had that yeah. Sanders. You could argue that we probably should have. Um, uh, based, but Democratic Party vote has a super, the super packs or not super super vote, something like that. It was that, a, you know, a, a, the super primary that, uh, that in one day that oh, it, 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 yeah. but it overwrites like there's a certain number of votes that overwrite other votes. Yeah. So even if he got the majority, he was really wasn't really going to get the majority. Um, but yeah, so the bottom line is, uh, you don't let these people steal your joy over the next uh, year and a half because it's it's going to be a lot out there to get worked up about. Personally, I just turn it off. I could care less at this point. You know, we watch to do. We well, yeah, yeah. Manage money, <laughs> have right? A job um, to do. Yeah. Uh, 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 chase chase down uh, all the all the planning changes that are going to be coming down the pike, um, and and how clients need to be reacting to that, mm-hmm. um, and you and know. discerning when they do and when they don't. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah. you know, like you, know, you can look at charts, and I brought one here, and we'll probably get into it at some point. But it shows major economic events over the past twenty years and yeah. how it affected the stock market. And on charts, I mean, they're little blips. I mean, it 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 felt terrible during the time, but they're just little blips on a long term chart. Yep. Okay, and these are major economic events. There are political events. There are geo geopolitical events. There are um, pandemic crises. You know, all these things occur but investing remains constant okay correct so we're going to talk so about let's today. dive into it five principles of successful investing one uh we have to set investment goals um it's much like going through life aimlessly without having any particular interest or any particular goal in mind it's kind of meaningless mm-hmm. just throwing money into something and the goal is to make money I don't know that that is really setting goals. <laughs> we get this question a lot, especially in our free consultations. You know, where somebody will call and will be online with them, or they'll come into the office, and 
We'll talk to them and they'll, they'll ask, well, what should I do with this? And the first question that we as investment professionals and financial planners always ask, what do you need the money to do for you? And when do you need that to happen? Yeah. You know, we're trying to get them to set a goal. Then we can make a provide advice and make a recommendation. But until then, I don't know what you should do with the money. Tell me what you want it to do for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look at it as, um, um, plan like a planning checklist you know well the first thing you do with extra money is pay off stupid debt so right. if you have large credit cards um big interest pay it off uh, car loan pay it off um are we paying off on the house to eliminate the mortgage prior to retirement so if the answer is yes great we move into emergency savings how much emergency savings maybe that money needs to go to emergency savings how much money emergency savings do we need? Probably at least six months of expenses in an economy where you might be concerned about your job. If you're solid on your job, maybe you take it down to three months. But you probably have bigger expenses coming up. Mm -hmm. You know, you need a roof at some point. You need air conditioning. You need that new car. So I would say just keep building building savings. Um, after that, then I I go over to retirement. Are we saving enough for retirement? And if they are then that's great. We checked that box. What about college education for the family? Well, we've kind of got a plan for that. Great. So then the next thing, this is where it gets exciting. And this is where I think a lot of the people who meet with us who have not done that first checklist is opportunity money. And that's where people lose the goal a little bit. They're like, well, I have this extra X of dollars per month and I just don't know where it should be going. And I don't know what the purpose is. And that's where I like, that's the fun part of the conversation for me. Cause I like to say, well, what are your goals and dreams? Right. You know? Right. And if, you know, if they don't have any specific goals or dreams, they want to be saving for, then I say, great. Then we're going to, you can put that money in a brokerage account. And then when you do retire between, let's say you retire at 65, between 65 and 75, you can create a brokerage account. That's going to send you almost tax free money, depending on, how tax loss harvesting goes right over that time period. But you theoretically could set up an account where you have tax free money and then you can start converting IRA to Roth at a very low cost basis, but, um, or a lo very low tax rate. That is, um, uh, that's what you call setting goals is going through all that. And then a lot of times people say, I've always wanted to have a lake house or I've always wanted to have a place, a large place that er the entire family could come and we could, commune and be together over holidays and you know but i don't know what that looks like that's what that opportunity fund's for you put money into an opportunity fund for for an opportunity that arises right it's for a life event that comes along yeah you know good or bad good or bad right. yes you know that you're prepared for it to take advantage of it or to mitigate yeah you know it if it happens to you imagine having an opportunity fund uh to buy a lake house in the year is two thousand and. Eight two thousand and nine. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 the word opportunity. <laughs> you know? What? Yeah. The, the the Chinese word for opportunity and the word for chaos is apparently the same. Same. Okay. Which means that in times of turmoil, opportunity exists. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And so that's why we have this money setting aside for when times get kind of turbulent. There are opportunities out there for people who are ready for it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I remember um, one of Dave Ramsey's programs. He, he, he talked actually it's in his, uh, and it's in his book. Um, uh, not the millionaire book, but the, the, the older book that, um, that floats around. Uh, anyway, uh, doesn't matter the copy, I guess, but he's written so many, but basically there was a, a, a long care guy who was over leveraged. And during the financial crisis, everyone had to, was cutting out the long guy, long guy pretty quick, right? Yeah. He was losing their jobs. So he had to liquidate everything at a fire sale. And he was just like, look, I've lost everything. I'll have to build this back up. Dave's kind of patting him on the back. Cause I don't know if you know this, but in Nashville, you can go watch the Dave Ramsey show live. Um, now there's, he, I think it's uh, soundproof glass or something, but he, they have regulars that just come by evidently and hang out. And this is one of the regulars. Another guy comes in, and uh, the next day, he's like grinning ear to ear. And Dave's like, man, why are you so happy? He goes, oh, no. you won't believe this, but I, you know, I run our lawn care business, and I just expanded my business and bought all these great uh, tractors and stuff at 50% off. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? That's the guy with the opportunity fund going, I'm, right. I'm going to make sure I have cash and capital available so when it all falls apart, I can take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, set investment goals. Uh, principle number one. Principle number two, understand your risk tolerance. So there are risk tolerance questionnaires that we give. I always joke and say we give these for the government. <laughs> it's hard proof that that um, we had a discussion. That's right. That we had the discussion. We brought it up. Yeah. We made the client recognize that there is risk in investing and tried to get them to understand how they're going to react to that risk when it occurs. Correct. And a risk tolerance questionnaire can help you do that, but really it's a discussion with your financial advisor and us understanding where the pain threshold is and, right. and going through that questionnaire um, definitely helps us helps us do that. Ultimately, um, really all you need is cash and something like the S&P 500. But for most people, that's too nerve wracking. So you have to work in uh, bonds, treasuries into the portfolio to help offset the volatility of, of the stock market over the long term. Mm-hmm. 2022, that was an That was an aberration. But, uh, but yeah, understanding your risk tolerance. So how much risk are you willing to take? And in our risk questionnaire, people always go, how come in, in the questionnaire asks how much money I'm going to invest? And I was like, well, that's because it's, it's not a fact finding thing. It's, it's in there because it wants to make the, it wants to make the questions relative to you. So if you put a hundred thousand dollars in there, it's, it's going to say, Hey, what happens if you lost 20,000? But if you're investing a million dollars and you lost twenty thousand, you'd be like, "Oh, who cares?" Right. <laughs> well, but the, if you lost two hundred thousand, right, right, that might be a totally different thing. Well, we talk about this with clients and investing relative to the magnitude increases as the balances increase. The percentages remain the same. Yeah. That twenty percent that you're referring to is twenty percent on a hundred thousand. This twenty percent on a million, but the magnitude is 10 times. Correct. Okay. And so it's it's understanding the magnitude of the volatility in the market and what it produces in terms of a gain or loss at any given time and then how a client's going to react to that yep. in a in an internal sense, okay? Whether yep. or not they're going to be comfortable with this, whether or not they are going to be able to withstand this, knowing or hoping we know <laughs> that the market's going to come back at some point in time. But does the market come back? Historically, yes, it has always come back. And it's referred to as the market is just resting and pausing before it prepares to launch a new high at some point in time in the future. So... There's there's a couple of ways to think about this. One is you can invest your risk tolerance, which I think this is where the benefit of a financial advisor is because a lot of times young people come in and they're conservative investors or moderate risk takers, yet they're probably leaving three four percent on the table and on average rate of return per year for their next twenty five years of their that they're working. But if they have someone they can call and talk to and under, help them understand why the market's doing what they're doing, what's happening in their portfolio, then they can see, you know, they would stick with it. Right. Where if they took a higher risk tolerance on their own, and, and you know, in our firm, your highest risk tolerance is like probably equal to the S&P 500. It's nothing like investing in Billy Bob's bait shop or losing all your money, you know, in right. some right. some crazy investment that yeah. no one's ever heard of. Um so, so it's that's the role of a, an advisor is to help guide people through the rough times of investing. Well, I think Vanguard put out a, some statistics on this a while back, didn't they? Where yeah. having advisor is 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 beneficial to a portfolio over a investment period three percent three percent per year. Yeah, and the idea being is that as an advisor, we act as that guide, you know, along that investment portfolio along with the financial plan right. and we're guiding the investor through these periods it's like guiding through the darkness yes. you know at some point in time and we're there at not just as a sounding board but also as a understanding you know the client and the risk and the financial plan and putting it all together saying we're still in the the, the zone of confidence that this is going to have a positive outcome correct um Diversify point three or principle three, um, diversify your portfolio. So 
you know, I was doing workshops. Um, I did the, for the Airline Pilots Association here in Atlanta. Uh, pilots would walk up to me afterwards and say, look, I've diversified my portfolio. And at the time, the, the, uh, the, the plan that I was advising on had three different large cap funds. There was an index, there was a value, and then there was a, a growth. And all actively, well, two actively managed, one passive, right? And it basically they said they diversified by taking their money and dividing it by three <laughs> and putting those categories, right? That's not diversification because a lot of times, well, in the value and the growth, you ended up with the exact same stocks that are also in the S&P 500. Which we call overlap. Yeah, okay. correct. <laughs> all the managers are investing in the same companies. O- over the years here at Wiser, we've seen only a small handful but people think that diversification has to do with the custodian. Yes. And I remember um, Matthews one time had a client that was with 30 different companies because that was diversification because someone told her you have to diversify who holds your money. And so she was in 30 companies and these are larger companies. So they all basically had the exact same portfolios in 30 different places. And just the administration alone, the logins, the statements, Mm -hmm. like you couldn't even manage it. How do you do tax loss harvesting on 30 different accounts at the same time? You you can't do it. No. And we're trying to explain to her that she can put everything at Schwab, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, and there's what they call SPIC insurance. And if those companies went out of business, she's guaranteed to still own those stocks. Right? Mm -hmm. And just could not grasp the concept. So we had to draft... 30 different portfolios, 30 different custodians. Actually, it was probably more like 60-something portfolios because each one had like an IRA or a Roth, right, or an individual brokerage account. That's not diversification. No, that's not. And there's no well, we real risk. we see this risk. from time to time. There's no so. real risk of a Schwab, uh, TD, Fidelity, um, going out of business and also taking your money with it. There's just zero risk with that. So that's not diversification. So ultimately, um, diversification is large cap, mid cap, small cap, foreign, bonds. Inside bonds, you have uh, maturity or duration, Mm -hmm. the time of the bond matures. So one to five year, five to 10, 10 to 30, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So those are your your bonds. And you have high yield bonds, which we don't invest in. We have emerging market, th- your third world country bonds, which we don't invest Invested. in. But that is, a, that is a diversification factor that some companies will deploy. So you want to get, you just picture each one has its own risk number. So the risk number of an S&P 500, and I'm making this up in my head, from zero to 10 is probably about a five. Maybe, right? Well, well, well okay, maybe seven. You say it is seven out of 10? Emerging markets is 10. Yes, if that was the boundary. If that's the boundary. Yes, Emerging market's 10. Right. Maybe the S&P 500 is, I give it a six now. Put U.S. Treasuries, treasuries down to a one and two. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, small mid-cap stocks are closer to eight. Um, and so, you, so each one of those is your volatility. And then assigned to that volatility is a rate of return. So typically the higher... The volatility, the higher the rate of return. Right. Over a significant period. Yes. Over a full market cycle. Not a one year period. No. Ten no. years plus. At least. Yeah. So you build a portfolio by diversifying optimally in each one of those categories. And if you're doing individual stocks, you got to be carrying at least sixteen stocks in different industries. Right. Not the same industry. Uh, 16 right. stocks in the tech sector is a tech portfolio. That's not a diversified portfolio. So if you look at last year, in 2022, um, the S&P 500 was down 18%, but energy was up over 60, right? Mm-hmm. So in a diversified portfolio, you would have participated in, in some of the energy increase. Right, but it, it held was, up. Other sectors. But it was masked. It, it was masked yeah. right. <laughs> by a negative across the board in other places. Well, energy only holds about a 6 to 7% weighting in the S&P 500 now. That's Whereas correct. in 2011, yeah. it was the largest weighting in the S&P 500. So Got replaced by tech. That's it did. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's, divers, that's diversifying a portfolio. And I don't think people understand what diversification means. I'm 
surprise I have to explain it on a podcast, but that's fine. That's what we're here. We're here to educate people. Uh, I had someone ask me last year that they were probably too old to be diversified, right? I just, I didn't even understand where the question, how the question related. I'm like, I mean, you're too old to diversify. It means that you had to put every, everything, all your eggs in one basket because you didn't save enough money. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Everybody yeah. should be diversified. If anything, if you're young, you could maybe just place everything in the S and P 500, I guess. But even that, 500 companies. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's still 500 companies. That's still diversified. It's, it's a single asset class. Yeah, with 500 companies. That's very true. Yeah, yeah, and I could actually get on board with that. Mm-hmm. You had a pretty good rate of return over the last two decades if you just had nothing but the S and P five hundred. Right, right. Yeah. Um, all right. Number four, invest for the long term. You have some data on this, don't you? Yeah, this is where it starts to get interesting. Okay, you know, investing over the long term is actually a fascinating um, endeavor for an individual. I find everyone okay. says that nobody does it. I know it. <laughs> That's part of what it right there is that having done it. Now I can look back on having invested. My first investments were in 19, or, you know, 1990. It's even hard to say that anymore. You okay. were really young then. I, I was old enough to have a few bucks to invest. <laughs> That's all I knew. But I was younger then than I am now, for sure. But I've seen through investing the ups and downs of the marketplace and all the events that can and do occur that affect the stock market, the economy, and our investments. But... Do they have a permanent effect on it? No, it's always a temporary effect that we're investors. It's not the market that reacts. It's in how investors react to the event that's occurring in the marketplace. Look, back in 2008, okay, this was during the great financial crisis. The, the, the financial markets actually froze up for about four days. Banks closed on an unprecedented period of four days it was a, a weekend and two days aside from that lehman brothers collapsed it was one of the first financial firms that we've seen collapse in a generation or more okay right. that occurred it brought on a decline in the, in the in the market over a period of 2000 beginning in 2007 in october of 2007 through 2008 into march of 2009 of straight declines down, down. I think the stock S and P went down some like fifty two percent at that point in time. On a chart today, it's a blip, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah, it was so dramatic. It was so time. dramatic, but it came back it beginning on March the 9th, two thousand nine, and had an unprecedented move for years that had occurred. Uh-huh. Then something else happened. And, and again, these are things that are out of most investors' complete control. You have absolutely no control over these events that occur, but they create chaos, which creates opportunity. I think in 2011, we had the U.S. debt being downgraded because they were, you know, the administration in Congress, again, was arguing about the, the debt ceiling yeah. um, so or, or the budget, I think it was then. So the U.S. debt was downgraded. It didn't default, but it was downgraded. The right. stock market went down like thousands of points at that point in time. Okay, um, it just happened. But again, on a on a chart over a long period of time, it's just a blip. I mean, it, you can't even see these things. I, you know, it, it, the problem is it's human nature. So we live in this world where diesel prices are cheaper for maybe three months in gas. So everyone sells their gas car and goes out and buy a diesel car. Right. Right, or gas gets really expensive for six to eight months, and then everyone sells their gas car and buys an electric car. And and so we live in this, just human nature thinks that whatever we're going through, we're, it's going to be this way forever, and that's never the case. It's only seasons. Right. And so when, when you are going through that, your emotions tell you, I've got to get off the ride. The ride's going to fall apart. And, and, you know, if we do, and that's, you know, every investor has the ability to do so in a liquid market. But for the person who stays in the market and invested $10,000 back in 2007 and let it ride for 20 years, they ended up with $35,000. Yeah. 
Even so, through these so ups and downs. T- if you invested in 07, you're talking about like the high in 07? That's another another status uh, stat I've, I've got here. The interesting thing about that, everybody's heard the story about if you miss the best days in the market, you know, how much lower your return is. Right. We get asked all the time, Casey, and it's a normal question, is now a good time to invest? And the, what We started out this podcast saying that this is a crazy time. Yeah. But does that mean it's not a good time to invest? It's always a good time to invest. Right. So let's take a look at some statistics around the person who in, may be the worst investor in history. Okay. Who's let's this take person? A, Louis the Loser. Louis the Loser had wow. the bad luck to invest every day for 20 years on this worst day of the year. The day, and then this chart is the Dow Jones Industrial Average right. at its peak each year. Invested ten thousand dollars at the Dow Jones peak every year for twenty years. Okay, okay. so Louis the loser. Which why would his parents name him that? That's so strange. <laughs> I don't know. This poor um, guy had the worst luck in so the world. So he invested at the highest for twenty years. For twenty always years, always bought at the high. Always bought at the high. The highest day of the year. For some reason, I mean, this. So at the end, he probably had no money. Probably imagine that. I mean, I mean <laughs> to have that much bad luck. Okay. So what was his return after 20 years? 20 years of investing $10,000 at the peak of the Dow Jones Industrial Average every year for 20 years, invested a total of $200,000. At the end of 20 years, he had $1,157,000. What's that an annualized rate of return? 15.7% 15.7% annualized return. 15. Right. So During this at, time period. So buying at the high, you got a 15% rate of return. Right. What From, if you bought at the every low? Do you have that? I'll put you on the spot. I do have it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else who invested on the low of the yeah. Dow Jones Industrials every year for 20 years right. okay, during the same time period would have a 17.2% return. So 2% per year difference in rate of return is fairly significant compounded but i'm surprised that it's only two percent difference on investing at highs versus investing at lows exactly interesting so is it a good time to invest it's always a good time to invest that's right because it goes back to what we were saying this is the country with the freest capital the highest capitalistic approach yeah to protecting capital to investing capital to to using capital to expand their products yep. and services in the economy. What's what's the same between those two examples is dividends. So whether if your money sits in cash, you cannot collect any of those dividends that those companies pay. That's correct. So even if Louie is buying at the all time high, if you went back and look at his rate of return, it's probably because of the income that he's receiving has a big part to do with it because even if you lose 18 percent a year like we did in 2022 you still would received the dividend your your dividend and depending on your entry point the yield could be anywhere from two to four percent depending on when you bought the shares initially and when you are in reinvesting those yeah you're buying more shares buying more shares at a lower price yep when the market goes down which generates more income which generates a larger dividend next time yeah Yes. That's the hidden part that nobody That's can the do the math on. Compounding. They, they only yeah. look at price in their head. They don't yeah. think about the income that's being generated. That's right. That's right. So that, that's probably why it's different. But I thought this one was unique and a good story to tell that it's always a good time to invest. In fact, we'll, we'll dr- dramatize it by saying picking the worst day of every year to invest yeah. and doing it. And what's the return versus having picked the best day of the year to invest? You probably should have Louie on the podcast and ask him how he's able to perfectly choose the highest day he'd probably get lost on the way here (laughs) uh principle number five (laughs) rebalance your portfolio regularly i think this is really hard for the diy investors um it requires excel spreadsheets and all that fun stuff today we have fancy computers that do Mm -hmm. that for us but it's interesting that that's principle number five because when you look at highest rate of return, it's really from the people who don't rebalance. They just let the winners ride, right? Um, but I, I think that it, I think it does a couple of things. I think one, it forces you to look at the portfolio and analyze, right? Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if you're in a like 
80% stock, 20% bonds, over time, the 80% stocks will become 90 and the bonds are going to become 10. Right. So the reason why you want to rebalance is it keeps it within your risk tolerance. Which goes back to which one of the... Which goes back to good behavior. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and understanding it, point number two, you know, understanding your risk tolerance. Correct. Correct. But what it also does is that it, it, it utilizes, really, when you're rebalancing, you're utilizing the principle of buying low and selling high. So when you're rebalancing, you're selling the highest valued assets in your portfolio. That's true. And reallocating them to the lower valued assets. That's so a really good point. So you're selling high yeah. and buying low. So, so it's the reverse. So in a 60-40 portfolio, which is most common for retirees now, 40% during COVID drop, that 40% up, went up by 7 so you took your 7% in gains and you then bought stocks, which were down 32% mm-hmm. at one point. And then when that 7% was invested in a stock that's down 32 and it came back, back, that added 3% to the rate of return from that one rebalance. Yes, it did. We did the calculation on yep. that. Mm-hmm. That's right. So th- that's another reason to rebound. So that goes back to being um, greedy when others are fearful. Yes. The but, Warren Buffett saying. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, a couple other principles to add, uh, do your research. Um, so you, before you invest in anything, make sure you understand it. You don't, we've had a few, few people come in our doors over the years with these leveraged ETFs. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Stay away from leverage margin ETFs that are doing two X, the S and P 500, even financial advisors, um, especially the ones at the big brokerage houses, they, they don't understand these products. They've never actually read the perspectives like we have, um, those are levered products that are being reset on a daily basis. And that's not, not something you want to mess with. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get, if the S and P does 8%, you're not going to get 16 because it resets daily. It's not annualized. Um, so you'd have to hit every day just right to really do a two X. Uh, it could be less, could be more theoretically. Um, but it's all almost, all, almost always, always less. So do your research, um, stay away from, Annuity products, um, that's another real killer for for asset growth, Um, especially the index annuities, which are um, big paydays for the advisors selling them. Uh, Part of research is also cost. Yeah, true. Yes. And some of the products that you just mentioned are are very high cost, high ticket, you know, cost products. Okay. Right. Because when you go walk into a Wells, uh, Edward Jones, or, or name any other place that that uh, is on all the street corners, their their whole purpose is to inc- to sell or to generate sell product, generate revenue, and if they can get away with it, they're going to do it at the well, hi- at the highest cost to you. Right, as because they're not fiduciaries. Okay? No, they, they're they, not. They're they not follow, required their suitability. Right. It, it's it's much like mortgages. You might be suitable or qualified to have a million dollar mortgage at yes. the age of sixty five, but should you have a million dollar mortgage? Most people have a million dollar mortgage at age of sixty five. No, no, uh-uh. no. But you could be qualified. You're qualified to buy this annuity. No one's going to get in trouble for selling you this annuity. That's right. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. Whereas what we do is we'll look at products side by side, and all things being equal, we'll choose the one with the lower expenses. Yeah. Right. Don't panic sell. And this is this is why this is the value of an advisor. Uh, Vanguard calls it advisor alpha. Um, what what value do we add to a relationship as portfolio managers? Um, at our firm, we we kind of look we look at ourselves as we're financial planners first. We also do asset management, uh, and that's where ninety percent of our revenues derived from is doing asset management. But if you look at that management fee, I'd say twenty five percent would be allocated toward research and portfolio management. The other seventy five percent is really more allocated toward financial planning which a lot of firms um, that do planning really only focus on retirement planning. They don't focus on anything else because they can't. They're, they're, there's no products to sell you to, um, to be able to offer other things. We don't sell any product, so it makes it easy for us to be financial planners first. Mm-hmm. But getting help from, a, from an advisor um, helps you put all this together and keep everything going down uh, the right path. And if something gets off, you have a relationship with a firm that has a benchmark of where you're supposed to be, right? And then how do we get back to that path? Or maybe things have gotten better, and then what else can you do with your resources, right? Exactly. Um, So, yeah, those are additional 
uh, principles. But uh, I guess just to recap, set investment goals, understand your risk tolerance, diversify your portfolio, invest for the long term, uh, and then rebalance your portfolio portfolio regularly are our five principles of um, successful investing. Um, thanks for listening. We've got some other bonus features available on a wiser retirement or podcast channel. Uh, we'll reference two of them here in um, our show notes. Uh, we have one video two bucket investment strategy, uh, income strategy versus total return. Uh, what's the number one rule in investing, right? That's a, a short little video we did. Also, uh, take a look at our other podcast, episode 154, Investing Through Times of Fear. This is episode's really going to apply, uh, I think, for 2024, which I'm sure we'll, we'll rebuild that by the time we get to the election cycle. Uh, designing Your Portfolio to Leave a Lasting Legacy, episode 121. So much of how we manage assets is really um, similar to endowments and how they manage assets, right? It is. We take an institutional approach, to, you know. And leaving a lasting legacy, you can do that through um, low-cost uh, indexing, the way we the way we approach it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Wise Wealth Management or want to schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com or you can cl- click on the link in the episode notes. Thanks, Brad. See Thanks, Casey. Week. Good talk. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley.